And we were just in these hallways and you could just feel the pressure from the tornado at that time. These walls were almost shaking. These, the, look, I mean, I think these are the same. <laughs> they were just shaking. And you, the pressure in your ears, it was like a popping. And it, and it sounded like a train, you know, you hear people say, that's how it sounded. So I figured that's when a big one was going over. I was at home and uh, hiding in my basement, like everybody in Grand Island was. And uh, I was listening to the newscasts and I was called uh, early in morning hours to get out here and see what I could do to help. that day and as we left work we noticed that the weather was kind of odd. It was kind of muggy out and it, it was really good tornado weather. And I remember my husband and I spending most of the evening down in our basement because of several sirens going off. And at one point after it had gotten dark, we heard the wind come up and there was this roar and we could hear some of our windows upstairs. Of course, you know, the husbands, you know, they're out there looking at what's going on and, and um, Rory came in, he says, we need to get mm -hmm. somewhere. He says, let's go over to the neighbors. And we shared a driveway. And we went over there, and Becky was about nine months old, and we went down to the basement, and the guys were up there for just a little bit, and then they, you could kind of, it's like you could feel it. Mm -hmm. It was just a, this rumbling, and then they came running down the stairs, and I had Becky in my lap, and I was over like this, and Rory came right over the top of me, and he, he just said, honey, I, whatever happens, I want you to know I love you. And I said, well, what's the matter? And he says, this is going to be bad. At that time, we didn't have all the equipment that we have here. Uh, fortunate to have the weather radio, the televisions, um, all of the different PBX things. We had a civil defense radio, and uh, at that time there were no weather warnings, no tornado watches and no tornado warnings. What we had was a window that we looked out of, and um, hopefully someone would warn us of them petting uh, bad weather. 
uh, on that, that late afternoon, I came to work, um, and it looked ominous around. It just seemed funny to me. And uh, when we changed shifts with the day, uh, the day uh, operator, there was no uh, warnings or no tornado watches. And so I kept monitoring the civil defense radio because it looked funny outside. And so we kept looking around. And um, I, I would kept calling and seeing if there was anything going on. And little by little, the, the rain started and it started blowing and it just looked funny. I had brought my, I remember I had brought my Bible school, vacation Bible school books to work on that night if I wasn't going to be busy. And quickly those were put away because I knew something was going on. This was a, a lobby and there was a countertop here. So I was looking out the windows on this side and that, and there was a window there. And over here and I could see wind, you know, trees blowing down and rain coming and it looked very, very scary. So um, I said, Craig Hahn, he was the pharmacist. He was still here for some reason. And he had been looking around too. So I decided I hadn't heard anything from the National Weather Service or from the Civil Defense. So I decided to get a better view out a window. So this was a hallway to what used to be the enclosed uh, porch with a big porch area. And I just, I didn't walk, I ran down here. And uh, this led to outside. These doors that are your cafeteria now uh, led to, to the outside porch area. And so there was a porch area here and the chapel over there. And what I did, there wasn't any wall here. So when I looked out, it would be like looking out here. Almost. And I looked up in the sky and I could see funnel cloud a big funnel cloud and maybe, maybe even a more than one but it, it totally scared me and freaked me out because I knew it was a you know a tornado or something very similar to a tornado and so I turned around ran back in to the switchboard area and immediately called the I think it was called the D plan code one which was the alert that the staff should get the members to safety because there was a tornado warning even though at that time and I think it was about an hour early between 7 30 and 8 and I don't think that they actually gave us a tornado warning through Grand Island until almost nine o'clock if if memory serves me right but I I sounded the alert Code early to the Liberty Cafe. there you go Code rescue to the Liberty Cafe Code I'm rescue to the Liberty Cafe there's a code, different code. At that time, it was D-Plan Code 1 and uh, alerted all the, the people to get the members to safety. Um, and at that time, like I said, I think I said before, it was a scary thing for me to do only because it was scary, but I, you know, I, I wasn't supposed to do that unless I had confirmation through Civil Defense or the National Weather Service. But I knew that something was going on. And besides that, I could hear the sounds, I could hear like a train and I know that was a sign of a tornado and when I ran back in you could feel you could feel tons of pressure already and and they hadn't even hit yet
amazing like now we we try to plan so much we yeah. got a policy for this oh, and yeah. a, an evacuation policy and we got all of this and you know something when it comes right down to it you know what to do yeah it's it's weird but you know yeah. what you have to do and just, like I said that night even the members you know for the most part during the tornado and everything else you didn't have the ones that wanted to stare out the windows you knew that there it was something real yeah. and it was something to be afraid of you know, it was, they knew it was something different. Uh, June 3rd was to be the first night of my vacation. But um, then the tornadoes hit, and I didn't get to go on vacation for about three more weeks. At the actual time of the tornado, um, I was actually spending that time with my two sisters in the uh, tornado shelter at Kingswood Estates. My youngest sister and her husband and their little son lived in Kingswood Estates at the time. And so we happened, uh, my middle sister and I happened to be going uh, with my youngest sister and we um, went to the tornado shelter at Kingswood Estates and we were there for over three hours. And this little room, which was probably meant for about 50 people, had over 200 people crowded into it. So it was um, quite a, an interesting experience. We didn't leave until around midnight, maybe a little after that night. And um, my sister's tra trailer was fine. We went over there and, and it was fine. It hadn't been damaged. And actually my car was sitting in the parking lot and it hadn't been damaged. So when we got back to her trailer, then I called, uh, first of all, we, I called our parents who lived here in town and they were okay and they were glad to hear that we were okay. Then the second call I made was out here to the Grand Island Veterans Home. And I spoke with a gentleman on the telephone. I explained who I was, that I was a night shift nurse, and I asked if they needed help. And his response was, yes, we need your help. Come in, but do not come down Capitol Avenue. You can't get through on Capitol Avenue. You'll have to go the long way um, around. It was after 1 o'clock in the morning by the time I actually made it here to the Grand Island Veterans Home. I remember driving down uh, Broadwell Avenue and a policeman stopped me and asked where I was going. I, I explained to him I was a nurse at the Veterans Home. I had my uniform on, I had my name tag on, and he just basically said, you go on over there, they need your help. And so I left him and drove north there on Broadwell to uh, the uh, corner there of Broadwell and Capitol Avenue. And the light fixtures, the poles, the uh, electrical wires were basically hanging down. The poles were bent and the light fixtures were actually hanging down. And I stopped my car because I didn't know if I could get through these wires or not. And I sat there for a few minutes. A pickup truck came up behind me, went around me, 
drove in around all of the live wires and took off uh, out of town heading north on, um, on, I think that turned into 281, so they headed north. So I figured if they could do it, I, I could give it a try. So I just drove through all of the wires very carefully. I made it through. I went up to Highway 2 and came in the back entrance to the veterans' home off of Highway 2. I was only able to drive about as far as the OT woodworking shop because there was a huge tree down across the road then and I couldn't make it any farther. So I parked my car, got out, and I walked to the back door of the Pershing building. And all the time I was doing this, I kept thinking, the veteran's home is set up to accept emergencies in case of a disaster. And I was trying to figure out, you know, and trying to remember how do we do triage and where would we put these emergencies coming in. I didn't realize the veteran's home was the emergency at the time. Um, I opened the back door of Pershing building and it literally fell off the hinges. It just fell off and I just, you know, let it go. I walked in and there were members up standing or sitting on chairs, sitting in their wheelchairs in the hallway on first floor Pershing. And they had been up all evening. They couldn't go back to their rooms because of the damage here. All of the windows were gone and it was too too damaged. And they were just sitting up. They were they were upset. They were crying. So I checked in with the nurse that was here in the building at the time and uh, let her know that I was here and then I, I comforted some of the members and I went on over to the Anderson building but this is where my snow boots came in handy I ended up taking my uniform shoes off putting my snow boots on in order to get through the walkway between Pershing and Anderson because all of the glass was gone a lot of the panels were gone there was mud, dirt, leaves, branches, whatever in the hallway and so I was it was a very wise thing to do to carry my snow boots in I guess um, I went on over to the Anderson building the PM shift was still here in all of the buildings in fact I later found out I was the only night shift employee that was able to make it in that night and so I went over and checked in with the PM nurse and she explained what happened what they were doing um, Basically, all of their members uh, were, well, they were sitting up, or what they had done was they took the mattresses off of the beds, and in that large solarium, which is now used for the meal time, they had laid the mattresses in rows, one after another, and they had covered them with clean sheets, and they had placed the members on the mattresses. Um, some of the members were still up in their wheelchairs or in other chairs. Nobody wanted to really go to bed or go to sleep. All the members were very keyed up and very anxious and upset with everything that was going on. So basically it was sort of like Florence Nightingale because there was no electricity so we went from member to member you know taking care of them, repositioning them and keeping them clean and dry but we were using flashlights. You know, when I finally was able to come upstairs, after we could feel the pressure wasn't so bad anymore, I thought there wasn't going to be anything left up here. I honestly did, and I thought it was just, but when I actually came in and started looking around, there was glass, you know, all out. The windows were all out. There was trees uprooted. There was stuff all over, everything, you know, from members' rooms and stuff, all over in the front and the back. I remember my friend, they found a wedding dress out in the lawn. There was a wedding dress. I don't know where that came from, but I remember that. And, and the, you know, the sheer force of the tornado with, with all the, the glass and the, and the water that started coming in the buildings too. I know over in the Pershing building, they, the, it just like four foot of water started just, just rushing in because of the intense rains and all of the, the windows and the doors that were broken out. When I came to work the next morning, I had no idea what to expect. I knew there'd been much devastation in the back part, of, in the south part of town because that's where we were. But when I approached the home, my, my heart completely sunk. I 
have truly loved the Grand Island Veterans Home since the day I began out here and the residents, the members that live here. And as I, as I approached the home from the west, it was a total devastation. The thing that came to my mind was, oh my, this, this must be what a, a war zone looks like. And I'd heard so many members, and they'd shared with me over the years, what it was like to be in various war zones and things. I remember pulling into the OT shop, and at first they wouldn't let any of the residents come in here because they were afraid of the glass and the things because the windows and roof were gone. And finally they did, and the first member that I remember coming in was a little fella named Hans. He was in his 80s, and when he came in, he, he just had a total look of loss and devastation and it was I don't know where to go from here and I think the first words that he said to me was my home my home my beautiful home it's destroyed it's gone and they really didn't want us to have the resident the members down here but we went ahead and let him come on in anyway and I remember he walked into the kitchen and he picked up a broom and he came out and he just started sweeping with a fever and he swept and he swept and he swept and he 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 was trying to I, I have no idea what was in his mind but you could go over and you could touch his shoulder and you could try to comfort him and and he ju he just was a lost soul and the next person that I remember coming in was um, a little lady named Jessie and she was 90 some years old and she always sat right over there on the corner and she came in and she looked and she tried to walk over to that that spot but she couldn't because it was really slippery and slick in here but we finally got a hold of her and I remember she just burst into tears you know and this little lady had been one that had always been so strong and she was just so stolic with everything that happened in life and and she too it was it, I guess the, the big word that I could use for everybody would be lost. Everybody was lost, including staff. I mean, we were lost too because it just seems like there's a dedication out here. Once you get going here at the home, you're, you're dedicated to the members, you're dedicated to the home and um, our family. We create a family out here and the family as we knew it was being tore apart by a physical physical thing that we had no control over. When coming back to work the next day, we first of all had to prove who we were to be able to get in. Um, it was difficult getting in because I was only, I only lived over here off of, uh, on, oh, off of Broadwell on Houston Street, just maybe four or five blocks away, but it took me about 30, 35 minutes to get through the debris from there to here to be able to come to work. Um, once I got here, we were en route moving people from Anderson Building over to the auditorium still. During the night, they had moved quite a few people, and there were a lot of emergency folks here trying the to The next help. morning, they called me and asked me to come in and uh, help because there was only one cook. I said, it might have been Marvel Hoover, I'm not sure, but uh, she needed help, so... I went in, uh, I and my daughter walked over because there were so many trees uh, d down that you couldn't get through uh, with a vehicle at all. Uh, those that did come in, oh, probably three or four of them, they drove in through the back door, uh, through the back side there. And uh, the only thing I can remember that we actually did was we made sandwiches. We didn't have any electricity there, so we uh, had to make sandwiches and uh, use that to feed the members, and they were glad they got something to eat. Here in the OT craft department, I could see that part of our roof had been taken off uh, the tar paper was actually laying over in the courtyard and when I got inside the department here uh, we actually had sections of the roof that had uh, been lifted up and shifted 
And so as I walked into the back of the building, of course it was kind of dark yet, there wasn't any electricity, but as I made my way back here to the greenware room, because of the rain and debris and stuff that had come into the greenware room here, we had what looked like a mudslide. The clay pieces had gotten wet, had melted, and run down. Um, I had, was stopped on my way into work by the National Guard and told to hurry up and get to work because I was needed there. As I come around behind the veterans home, uh, the curtains, all the windows were busted out and you could see curtains flying in the wind. Uh, there was no windows, um, you know, broken glass was everywhere. Um, I expected to see, you know, bodies and all kinds of, of chaos, but um, no lights. Uh, we, I think the generators had kicked in by the time I got here, but uh, the elevators were shut down, of course, and a lot of broken glass everywhere. Um, they had, um, uh, no members were injured though. We did have uh, one, one female member that had gotten hit in the head with a rock that came through the window and had some stitches, but everybody else was in very good shape uh, for, for the condition the property was in. Uh, out front, the trees looked like they'd been picked up and set on their side. You could just see, you know, huge roots sticking out of the bottom of them. Um, some were split right down the middle. Um, I remember coming over to administration building and these, every one of these uh, big windows were busted out. So we did a lot of cleaning up glass and things like that that first, uh, that first morning, trying to um, just make it a safe environment to even, you know, to work in. Uh, the, it looked like a battlefield out here, like something, bombs had been dropped, everything was tore up. And got out here and uh, I guess we did a little bit of everything, just kind of pulled things out of the way and uh, got on the phone that morning and we tried to get uh, contractors and people to come in and help us. And That was one of my jobs too, is to try to get help uh, lined up. Uh, it's kind of, everybody was running in all directions. The next morning, um, our administrator at the time and a day shift nurse and I met and we ended up meeting every morning for about half an hour uh, to see what had happened through the past the previous 24 hours and how we could handle things so um, the three of us met several days then um, that week um, I would come in to work in the evening probably sometime between 7 and 9 p.m. and I would uh, not leave until around 9 the next morning or so. Um, what they did during the daytime then was they had to remove a lot of the members uh, from the different buildings. For example, Pershing building members, they found beds for them over in McKinley and they cleaned you know that area up and they moved the Pershing member members over there. Um, the they also cleaned up the auditorium area and moved beds and members over to the auditorium because most of the members had to be removed from the Anderson building and so they moved a lot of them over there. We had, used to have a room off of the cafeteria called the Blue Room and it was just an area that was set up with tables and chairs and a lot of the staff used to take their breaks or eat their meals in the blue room. Well they cleared out the tables and chairs and they moved in mattresses because there were still more members that needed a place you know to stay. And um, there were probably 25-30 members in that small um, Pretty much to be able to provide care while we were over in the administration building. Water, plumbing, those kind of things weren't really available. Um, for toileting, we had um, in the back there was like a storage room and we had um, like portable potty chairs set up back there and they had plastic bags in them. And that's what we had to use to get people to use the toilets. We use like baby wipes and those kind of things to to use for cleaning and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the kitchen was able to get water from like the Red Cross and I believe we had a well or something that they were able to at least warm up some water that we would bag up and keep, you know, for like bed baths or just little freshen up baths. 
Um, all of our food and everything came over on a cart, but it was all served on paper plates, plastic, anything that was um, disposable. It was kind of like the old pictures of an army barracks where there were just beds lined up everywhere because we didn't have, the auditorium just one big room. For those members that had family that could, they came and got them, but that was only after um, several days when outs, people from outside of town could come into town. It was over us was on vacation, so I had to take over as the head man, and all the guys was working with me. The first thing we done was try to clear all the sidewalks so that everybody could walk, and of course we had people coming in from all over working with the trees. We had a lot of the trees were down. And, and uh, but we had a lot of help come in and got the trees and out and, and the administrator he he didn't think we should do all that because he thought we should keep it there at the home we didn't have no thing you know we didn't have nothing to do with but the home you know the trees and that and so uh the five they started taking them and, and getting them out one night the aide that was over there called me and she said, you need to come. I have a very upset member here. So I went on over to the Blue Room and we started visiting and this member was very um, upset and kind of agitated. And finally, you know, um, I, I said to him, and I called him by name and said, do you remember that we had the tornadoes and that's why you're staying here and sleeping here for right now. We'll get you your room back as soon as we can. And he looked at me and with tears in his eyes, he said, do you mean that wasn't a bad dream? Every one of us that was working remembered picking this rock up and throwing it away. But every, t every time we turned around, this rock would be there. Now, I don't know if there was a phantom in here or what, but this, this, this rock, and we knew it had to be the same rock because the formation of it is um, quite, quite different, so it wouldn't be like we could just go get a rock. Well, where this rock came from was this, the roof because the roof of this building had rock on it. And when you would look out the window, the roof was over there, but this one crazy rock was here in the building. And you'd trip over it, or you'd start sweeping something up, and this rock would, would just appear. So finally, we uh, called it our pet rock. Now, I see there's a lot of red stuff on it, and I'm glad it's not blood, but <laughs> anyway, I wouldn't be holding it if it was. But um, we finally uh, named it our pet rock, and it's hard to believe that this pet rock has been around <laughs> ever since that time. And I know I no longer work in the I no longer work at the Grand Island Veterans Home. I've retired, but I know that every time I come down here to the uh, occupational therapy department, I go over there and I pull that uh, drawer open, and I look because I say, well, I just want to make sure that our pet rock has not left us. And you know, I think sometimes this rock is kind of an example of the strength and the courage and the faith that the members and the staff and the community, because the community was trying to, to get back together at the time. But I think that this rock kind of is a representative of uh, what a strong facility we are, how strong the, res the members are that come here to live, how strong the staff is, and how strong our faith is.
We see more people that are taking care of in home health settings. So by the time they come to us, they can be very ill. Um, sometimes they're, they're not here long before they pass away. So I think that kind of steps up the amount of care that we give because they're, they're already pretty compromised from when they get here. Um, I look for, you know, seeing younger um, members come in um, from, you know, from our last and those things. I think we'll start seeing some younger uh, whose needs will be much different than, you know, the geriatric public that we've been taking care of years, um, for years and years. But I think the home offers a wonderful variety of activities and you know, um, different nursing challenges that they can uh, take care of any medical needs and any, you know, modern equipment we have nowadays, I, I see the members getting better care because of all the fancy wheelchairs that they can use and the beds that are so much more comfortable than they used to be. And uh, I think it's, everything is getting so much more uh, modernized and convenient that I see the members. Should be a lot like the past. We need to take care of the veterans. Uh, when they're in need and uh, disabled, they need a place to go. And uh, it has to be affordable, which it is out here. It's very affordable. The care here is very good. Everything, everybody I talk to, uh, says the nursing department is doing a very good job and offers everyone else to do a good job. We have to continue to make the people feel at home. I don't want to do this, but we're not here because I don't want to do this.